think uh, the big part of the management has been uh, touched on by uh, Dr. Chris Lian. So just sort of summarize the uh, overall uh, medical management of uh, PED. Um, in Parkinson's, we know it's a neurodegenerative diseases. So in terms of the treatment goals for any form of neurodegenerative diseases, we want to ask ourselves, are there any medications that can actually help to protect the cell from dying? Or if the cell has already been dead, is there any way we can actually replace the dead cell? Um, unfortunately, all this is still in the realms of research. And so our main talk right now, the medications, all right, the treatment uh, modalities that we have is mainly symptomatic treatment. Now this may look like a busy slide, but otherwise it summarizes all the different treatment modalities there are in managing Parkinson's disease. Well, we can see that there is the rehabilitation procedures, which Dr. Chris Lenz has touched about. Then the surgical management, which Dr. John Thomas will be touching on later. And so my main bulk is actually talking about all these different types of medications. Well, it may look confusing, but you can actually divide them into those drugs that act on the dopamine and those that act on non-dopamine pathway. And of those that act on the dopamine pathway, we have drugs that actually produces the dopamine synthesis like the Madopa. Those that act on the receptors in cell, like for example, the um, dopamine agonist, as well as those actually increase the bioavailability of either dopamine or the Madopa, such as the MAOB inhibitors, as well as the COMT inhibitors. Now the questions most often that come to our mind is, of all these different types of medication, um, which one do I use? All right, do I start on my dopa straight away? Some people say that we should start on dopamine agonist. What about artane? What about selegiline? All right, there are so much talks about all this medication. I think not all the Parkinson's disease are the same. All right, as um, Dr. Jun Tan has mentioned, uh, idiopathic Parkinson's disease is actually probably a mixed bag of different either idiopathic or sporadic uh, PD or familiar PD. Now. We have to, based on individualized treatment, we have looked into the individual based on their age, the stage of the disease, the level of the activities they have, any other associated psychological medical conditions they have, and obviously in this day of age, you know, patient factors is very important. Whatever it is, of all the medications, I think the key word is we should start with a very low dose of medication and go slow. Therefore, we have to titrate the medication slowly. In PD patients who are in the early stages, all right, uh, without any complications, which are just symptomatic, we may not even need to actually give them any oral medications to treat with if they are coping well. More importantly, at these stages, we should explain to them about diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, and uh, with a good command of the knowledge on the disease, all right, we advise them to actually remain healthy, have a healthy, balanced diet, physiotherapy, exercise regime and very good social support is very utmost importance in the early stages. What if they become more symptomatic when they're beginning to feel that the mobility issues is beginning to uh, hamper the activities of daily living? Then we may want to consider certain oral medications. Of the different types of oral medication at these stages, we can think in terms of four big groups. The anticholinergic drugs like Artane, the MAOB inhibitors like selegilin, the dopamine agonists like, for example, bromocryptin, and the liver dopa groups such as Madopa. Most of them eventually would need so-called the real drugs, all right, the, the strong drugs such as Madopa, or in fact the surrogates like dopamine agonists. But in the early stages, I think most of us may be aware of you know, artin, anticholinergic drugs which have been used since the 1940s or even the selegiline, which has been used since the 1980s. But as I touch on individually on these type of drugs, what are the uh, benefits as well as the limitations? Anticholinergic drugs like Artane. Anticholinergic drugs like Artane. Uh, advantages, well, it has some anti-Parkinson effects. There are some reports that says it may help to control the tremor. Um, but caution in use is, because being anticholinergic, it has lots of side effects, and therefore, it's definitely a no-no in most of the elderly patients, by which majority of them have Parkinson's disease are in the older age group. Some of the side effects include dry eyes, dry mouth, constipation, urinary retention, or hallucinations, and so forth. And our guidelines states that anticholinergic agents may be used as symptomatic monotherapy. So we can use it maybe as early stages, or maybe as an adjunct stage to treat patients with Parkinson's. All right, maybe 
it may help in terms of the tremor and stiffness. But the caution in use is if it's elderly, all right, we try not to use anticholinergic agents. If it's become more symptomatic, we try not to use because the anti-Parkinson effects is actually very mild and the documentation about it being a D treatment for tremor is not 100% true. Uh, by treating Parkinson's disease well, we can also control the tremor to some extent and not all patients who started on Artane actually do respond to the tremor. The next drug we talk about is Selegiline or MAOB inhibitors, the Jumex. It is also another drug that has mild anti-Parkinson's effects and um, in the basic science in the laboratories, it shows that it may help to prevent nigrostriatal cell death. So there has been some postulate that it may be neuroprotective. In fact, that was how the drug is being marketed back in the late 80s and early 1990s. So a lot of us uh, have been giving selegiline in the past, uh, hoping that it may be neuroprotective. But now two decades have passed and it's become more conclusive that the selegiline itself is not neuroprotective in nature. Whatever benefits it has is mainly symptomatic treatment. Uh, furthermore, it is also a drug with not only just mild anti-Parkinson activities, it has also a lot of other side effects such as heartburn, dizziness, anxiety, insomnia, confusion and so forth. And therefore, if a person has already in the more severe stages of Parkinson's disease, with a lot of neuropsychiatric symptoms, Sedergenin is usually, uh, as seen from Dr. Christian's slides, one of the drugs to go. Therefore, Sedergenin is group B, a great B evidence that it is efficacious as a symptomatic monotherapy, but only in the early stages. Or in the late stages, when they have all these neuropsychiatric side effects, in view of the side effects of this Sedergenin, it's probably better not to give Sedergenin at all. Therefore, it goes back to uh, levodopa which is still the gold standard drugs since the late 1960s. Liver dopa have uh, various formulations. We can think in terms of those that are the regular immediate release uh, version, as well as those uh, controlled release version, also called the CR or HBS, Maldopa HBS. So this is how the immediate release version of Maldopa looks like. The immediate release version of Cinemat looks like. And these are the controlled release, either the Maldopa HBS for Maldopa or the Cinemat uh, CR and you recognize the different types based on the color. The immediate release cinemat is yellow in color, whereas the controlled release is actually beige in color. So sometimes the patient may tell you that I'm on cinemat, you can always ask them, no, were you on the yellow color cinemat or is it the beige color? If they tell you it's yellow color, you know that it's actually an immediate release version. Now, whether is it Madopa or cinemat is the same, it's just the different types of uh, formulation. The main active ingredients, levodopa, is still the same, and we can actually use that interchangeably. Side effects, it can cause a lot of nausea, vomiting, postural hypotension, and long term wise, um, we have been read in the literature that it can cause motor fluctuations in this kinesia up to about 10% a year, and therefore, most literature will say that by five years down the road, about half of them will have some form of motor complications. To the extent a lot of uh, patients has a misconception that, oh, levodopa is actually you know, not such a good drug after all. It can cause all these motor complications. But most of the research uh, and the current literature has suggested that the motor fluctuations is actually very much disease dependent. It, by five years down the road or 10 years down the road into the disease, because of the nature of the illness, or they will have prone to actually having all these motor fluctuations. And it also depends on the way we are giving the levodopa, uh, that how we can actually give it to prevent motor fluctuations, which I'll touch on later on. So levodopa um, is great A evidence that it is the most efficacious drug, or is, in fact, it's the gold standard for the treatment of both early as well as late stages of Parkinson's disease. But we should keep it, all right, the lowest dose possible. All right, because of the potential side effects that can occur in patients with all those uh, motor dyskinesia and fluctuation. Therefore, that's how dopamine agonist comes about. These are synthetic drugs that act on the dopamine receptors directly. Um, various types, we have bromocryptin, pergolite, trivestyl, ropinorol, and even latest, some of you may have heard about cifro or primipexol. They act directly on the dopamine receptors and therefore brings about the benefits just like liver dopa. And one further advantage is that it can help to prevent and delay the onset of motor complications. If you look at the, uh, these slides here, these are the 
slides on ropinerol, and this is the slide on premipexol or cifro. This is the empty dots is the dopamine agonist, and the solid dots are liver dopa. This is based on how well it controls the symptoms of uh, daily activities, how well it controls the motor functions. So the two lines are very close together, therefore you can say that they are quite comparable. If you combat about incidence of this kinesia, the solid line is the dopamine agonist. The, the other line is actually liver dopa. So this graph actually shows the higher the line, the less chances of it having all the motor dyskinesia and fluctuations. Similarly, this slice is actually a reverse. Similarly, this slice is actually a reverse. The lower the line, it's actually this less likely for it to develop motor fluctuations. Therefore, you can see that initially, you may not, not tell the difference, but after three to five years down the road, if you start the dopamine agonist early, there's actually a significant difference, or it can really help to prevent or delay the incidence of motor dyskinesia. But some people will say that, well, Doc, uh, you give me liver dopa, you know, I, I feel good, but now you change it to uh, dopamine agonist, bromocryptin, I don't feel as good as before. You know. It's true, all right. Although the lines shows that they are more comparable, if you actually scrutinize it carefully, the empty dots, which is the dopamine agonist, is always higher than the solid dots. All right. The higher the number here, that means more disability, more dysfunctions there are. So therefore, we have written here is that the anti-Parkinson effects are not superior to liver dopa for the dopamine agonist, but it's still comparable. The benefits is that it can help to prevent or delay the onset of motor complications. Side effects of dopamine agonists are quite similar. They can cause nausea, vomiting, posture giddiness. But more specifically, some of the dopamine agonists are derived from the ergotamine, such as bromocryptin, pergolite. So they can cause all these ergot complications, such as fibrosis, of which pergolite recently, uh, over the past few years, have received a lot of bad publicity because they find a high incidence of a pergolite causing restrictive valvular heart diseases. And this has since been taken off the market, both in the States and uh, in Singapore, we have also phasing out pergolite and switching patients from pergolite to other dopamine agonists. Other side effects have been documented are somnolence, especially with Premipexol and Ropinerol. But then again, excessive daytime sleepiness is quite non-specific because it can also occur in patients with severe Parkinson's disease, as well as patients with Parkinson's disease on liver dopa as well. So dopamine agonists are efficacious, both as a symptomatic monotherapy, as well as as adjunct therapy to liver dopa. Now, which one to use? There are so many of them. This is a busy slide, but not meant to be copied. But it's meant just to tell you that of all the different dopamine agonists, they are, have different marketing strategies, because there are so many different types of dopamine receptors, D1, D2, D3, D4. D1, D2 acts more on the motor symptoms. The D3, D4, and 5 acts more on the neuropsychiatric symptoms. So therefore, some drugs will say that they have more D3 activities, more D2, some are benefit than the other. But the general consensus is that all of them are comparable. We can actually use one or the other. Some patients may uh, react differently, just like NSAIDs, all right? You respond to NSAIDs, maybe some respond better to one type onto the other. So if a person says that the bromocryptin doesn't seem to work, you can change to maybe ropinerol or cifro. And uh, if really cannot work, then maybe you move on to liver dopa.